and that's what we have. But now we are very happy to have here Anne Applebaum, uh, who is the columnist at Washington Post and an expert on post-communist transition. Anne is running Transition Forum at the Legatum Institute in English and is a famous intellectual explaining a lot, a lot, a lot about what's happening in this part of the world uh, for many years, but especially now. So welcome to the studio. Thank you very much. Thanks for having me. As always, we're happy to have you here. And we have a few questions, so having a champion explainer is a good one, um, especially as we're seeing the pressure in Russia kind of build up. You know, you had this adventure in Ukraine, and now you have a new one in Syria. How is Putin keeping control of the Russian populace? What sort of tools is he using there? Is there anything new going on, or is it old trends being built up on? I should first of all say this question of old and new is a complicated one. Um, Putin and the people around him are people who were trained and educated by the KGB. And so, so that's old. That's, that's old. That's their mentality. That's where they're coming from. That's the, you, know, you, can, you can see it in how they see the world. Um, many of the techniques they now use, um, however, are new and more, more sophisticated, actually, than, than, than the old-fashioned um, you know, the old-fashioned forms of media control and social control that, that the Soviet Union used. So Russia is really a very different place now. Um, but you know, if we just speak about media, um, you, of course, in, you know, in Ukraine know this better than anybody, but um, the, the way in which Putin manipulates the media is, again, both new and old. So it, nowadays there isn't one Pravda or one television channel saying the same thing over here, the Soviet Union is good. Now you have a dozen of them. They sound different. They argue with each other sometimes. Um, you know, new television channels, entertainment channels, newspapers, websites. Um, but they, but about 95 percent of them stay within a single narrative. So although they are different and they sound different and different people work at them, they, they underline the same points over and over again. And this is echoed also in social media and it's echoed um, in politicians' statements. And you can, you know, I, I can always tell from my Twitter account what is the Russian line of this week or this month because it begins to be repeated repeated by people commenting. People come around. out of nowhere. And it people come out of nowhere. And so, and so, so I mean, that's sort of a new version of the party line coming down, where before right. it was in the party paper, now right. it's through these different sources, but works right. out to be the right. same. Right, right. Well, and, and, you know, the Syria thing has been interesting. You know, even you, the com you know, until recently, the, the, you know, the Russian line was all about Ukraine. You, the Ukrainians are Nazis. We need to form again an anti-fascist coalition to fight against the Ukrainians. Um, you know, we're saving our Russian brothers in Ukraine. You know, these are the kinds of lines you would hear. Now there's been a shift. And now what you're hearing is, um, you know, the West is degenerate. It's no longer able to, to, to do anything in the Middle East. Russia is going to show the way and lead the world by doing something decisive. And you actually hear, have heard this echoed um, in the last few weeks by um, some of the people who, who some even European politicians who sometimes echo what Putin says. So they'll say things like, um, uh, you know, Ukraine isn't important. What we really, you know, we need to focus on Syria. And, you know, the real crisis facing Russia is refugees, not Ukraine, not Russia. So, in other words, he's trying to shift the argument so that now we're talking about Russia as a country which is in the center of international debate and we need Russia in the Middle East and so on. But is this assertion, is it just preposterous? Because you see the same arguments being used, you know, arguments about orthodox tradition in terms of religion, mm -hmm. argument about Nazis. You know, in front of the UN, you had Putin and talking about the coalition created to fight Hitler and now a new coalition needed to be created to fight ISIS. And is just, this just pushing propaganda to the breaking point or does this have you know, some treads to it? No, I mean, I think there's some logic to it. Um, you know, and I think that there are people who are willing to listen to it and are willing to, to pick up on it. And I'm, I'm sure that his calculation is that it will work inside Russia. Um, you know, inside Russia, where incidentally the Ukraine war was beginning to be, was beginning to lose traction. People were less interested in it. The number, television watching numbers were down. Um, also, Putin wasn't really winning in Ukraine, or at least not in the way he wanted to win. But that is and a so question. now he's changed the subject and he's, you know, moved, you know, now the only thing on Russian television is Syria. At the same time, there, are, there is a lot of uh, debates and like, has Putin won? What's your answer on that? Depends what you mean by win. Yeah. Um, <laughs> uh, to use an Americanism, but um, it, it, so no, he didn't. He didn't win in the in his original idea. In the original idea of creating Novorossiya, breaking mm -hmm. off all of eastern Ukraine, creating a new state, something like Transnistria. No, he did not succeed in doing that. I think what happened was is that he believed his own propaganda, and he didn't believe. 
No, he did, he did believe that you know, anybody who spoke Russian in eastern Ukraine wasn't a Ukrainian. They were Russian. And so they really would you know, come out on the streets and cheer when Russian soldiers came. But if came you get it. the ball rolling and then That's it would kind of go by itself. That was what itself. he thought would happen. Yeah. That didn't happen. And Ukrainians did fight back, you know, for better or for worse. Um, and, you know, he didn't expect to have any opposition, and he did. And so he, he failed everywhere except sort of in Donetsk and Luhansk, but at a huge cost. And so that was not the idea that he wanted. So, no, he didn't succeed in creating Novorossiya. Um, of course, what he did do was he destabilized eastern Ukraine, and, of course, he can continue to do that, as you I, I don't have to tell you in, in many other ways. And uh, before we go into that, I also encourage you to ask uh, questions in our Twitter. Also, you would, can address a question to Anne, um, so she might answer, uh, being here live in Kyiv. And with this um, inner disturbance also, because it's a different stage of the conflict. Uh, I mean, there was an occupation of Crimea, later there was a full-scale war in the east of Ukraine. Now it looks different, a frozen conflict, wherever you uh, call it. So um, what do you see the, are the other tools of influence at, that, at this moment? Well, the frozen conflict can obviously be revived at any time. So that's, you know, it's always there. You know it. You know, it can always be, it can always be created, recreated again. I mean, for, you know, it's not an accident that it went quiet just as the Syria crisis began, because the conflict depends on how much the Russians want it to be there. So it's their conflict. Um, they have economic tools in Ukraine. Um, they have, you know, media tools in Ukraine. They have agents of influence, which is a, a fancy way of saying, you know, people who, who either are on the payroll or who are, you know, interested in, 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 in helping them achieve things, in, in particular Ukrainian businesses or industries, but also in, in the Ukrainian government. So they have, you know, there are many ways in which they can attempt to manipulate um, what happens in Ukraine, even if they even if the conflict remains frozen for a period of time. I mean, you know, even the most obvious, you know, boycotts, you know, the gas, um, agricultural boycotts, you know, there, there are plenty of things they can do to, to damage the Ukrainian economy. Well, there are levers to work all of that. There are levers. I want to mm -hmm. pivot slightly just to talk about the EU. I mean, we've seen a lot of efforts by Putin to try and divide Europe mm -hmm. um, and to try and to break them apart, uh, and mm -hmm. particularly in terms of far-right governments. Yeah, I think, um, by the way, that's his main foreign policy goal, more important than Ukraine. Okay, is Europe so dividing it? To, to divide Europe, to, and, you know, I mean, it's very ambitious, and maybe he probably can't do it, but he can do damage, which is to divide Europe, divide NATO, you know, and eventually get the Americans to leave. I mean, I think that's the, that's the, that's the big goal. Well, to hollow out the institutions. To hollow which out is something the institutions, which do. are in trouble anyway. So, yes. And that's what I wanted to ask about, because when we look at the migrant crisis, you know, that puts these European organizations under great and greater stress in governments. I mean, what sort of, how do, do these crises help Putin when there's something larger that then something like the EU is having difficulty confronting? Does that aid him? No, I think crises in the West are very useful for him. Um, I think the refugee crisis has been very important for him. It's good for the right-wing parties that he supports and that are pro-Russian, mm -hmm. uh, pro-Putinist, I shouldn't say pro-Russian, in, in the EU. Um, it creates, um, you know, a sense of dissatisfaction in the EU. You know, European institutions seem unable to deal with this, which is true. They, they are unable to deal with it. Um, and so it, 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 it adds to his, you know, and it also, as I said, we've heard these arguments, I think, um, you know, if, if, if memory serves, we've heard them from President Zeman in the Czech Republic, who said, you know, this refugee crisis is what's really important. Russia, you know, this conflict with Russia needs to be put aside so that we can resolve this refugee crisis together. And Viktor Orban has said something like that as well. So, so you know, he, it, it, it enables people who, um, who, who may have their own issues with the EU also to... to, to when it's trying to change the conversation in another way, it's saying, let's, you know, let's not talk about Ukraine, let's not talk about that, let's talk about refugees. Yes. These are people who didn't want to have the conversation about Russia yes. to begin with. Yes. Another story with this, um, you know, where the conversation is, um, it's a lot about populism, but also it's a lot about this relativism, you know, that everybody is equally bad, everybody has its own agenda, so that was something different. You're corrupt, which we, you're corrupt. Yeah. Right. But um, that's what we've discussed discussed um, how it's working. Is it really that there is this huge distrust in Europe um, regarding also their governments and how it's not just about the Russia. That's what we feel also when um, we talk as Ukrainians to many people in different European countries that there is this kind of a huge distrust everywhere to the governments and uh, who are acting currently in the European Union, in the UK, in Poland, in Hungary, in the United States. So how um, 
that everybody is corrupt. You know, when the Ukrainians are coming and explaining, you know, we had a corrupt president, like our, ours are not uh, even a bit better. Um, so, what impact that kind of change of discussion has to the? Well, so there, you've, you just asked sort of several things at once. I mean, so yes, there has been a, a Russian line. Um, and I, you know, I've heard it several times from senior Russians, you know, myself, which is, okay, I admit, you know, we have corruption. Maybe even Putin is corrupt. But you're also corrupt, and you're corrupt in exactly the same way. And there's no moral difference between you and us. And the West and Russia are really the same. And there isn't any, you know, there's no distinction to be made between them. And so you might as well trade with us anyway. So stop talking about it. And that's a line that they use, which I think is designed mostly to work inside Russia. Um, to, to, you know, to convince Russians there's no alternative. Like, okay, maybe this system isn't perfect, but believe me, you won't find anything better anywhere else. Um, when it appeals you know, to that built-in cynicism And it appeals well. to this, this kind of post-Soviet cynicism. Um, and, but, but, the, but the second issue is, you know, yes, there is something else happening um, in Western Europe and the United States, I would say, which is um, par partly to do with the breakdown of a, of a not, not so much mainstream media, but a mainstream political dialogue. You know, you're beginning to have sort of media communities that don't speak to each other. So, you know, a right wing and a left wing, which not only disagree about, you know, what we should do about um, the transportation system, but they don't actually even agree what the problem is. There's no, there's no joint narrative. Um, and that makes it very hard to do any kind of political deals or make compromises if you don't e even agree what the story is. If one group is watching one television station and reading one set of internet media and the other one is doing the other. And you have this, and this is now true all over Western Europe, not just all over Europe and the United States. And this makes, uh, this is making, you know, it's creating um, difficulty for democracy and it's creating a difficult, it's sort of, um, creating a lot of distrust towards the government and towards, particularly if you're in one narrative and you don't understand the point of view of the other, it's making people have more difficulty speaking to each other. Um, if to um, try to be concise with all this, also I'm asking very general questions, but still, you were arguing that there is no real strategy uh, toward this region, towards Ukraine, Russia, um, uh, by the European Union and by the West. Is it somewhere there? Has it appeared uh, by this stage? So there are pieces of it, um, and there are, um, you know, there are people who are beginning to have a strategy. Um, it's an unusually bad moment, and you know, we're at an unusually bad moment in the American political cycle because Obama is reaching the end of his administration. He's not able to, um, to, he, he's not going to do anything dramatic. He's a lame duck president. He's a lame duck president already, very early actually. Um, we don't know yet who's going to follow him and what their policy will be. Um, you have the weakest president in French history that anybody can ever remember, who also seems unable to take um, clear decisions. Um, you have a, a British government which is the most inward-looking and most divided also, not, not divided, but most inward-looking and most obsessed with its own domestic problems of any British government I can remember. Um, and so you have, you know, so all that leaves Germany. Um, and Germany is a country which is uniquely badly equipped to be a foreign policy leader. You know, it hasn't been one since the war. It's, ta it's always taken its lead, you know, from Britain and France or from the United States or from NATO or from the EU. And it doesn't have, it's not used to thinking of itself as a leader and as of the country that forms the long-term foreign policy but strategy. But why is that? Is it just because it can't take military action or is it, it goes can't take military that? action, but it's, it's also, it's, it's, the Germans are unaccustomed to thinking of themselves as the leaders of Europe. I know that sounds strange because everybody else thinks they are, but mm. they have, you know, they've, they've felt comfortable doing it econom in economics for a right. long time. You know, that's sort of their area. But, you know, defense strategy, um, you know, big international relations questions, that was, that's what the U.S. did for them, you know, through NATO or through something else, or that's what, that was done, you know, the Mrs. Thatcher or, or Mitterrand, you know, these were the leaders um, uh, of Europe. And the Germans were always somewhat a little bit behind. And they don't even, they don't really even have a way of thinking institutionally about it. Um, well, from you know, what you're saying, though, then it sounds like there's a power vacuum in Western there is a power leadership. Vacuum. There is an, I am saying that. 
there is a power <laughs> vacuum. There's a it's power a vacuum. Curve. You have. It's just. I mean, even ten years ago, there was a more cohesive. You know, in some ways, it's luck. I mean, it's mm -hmm. to do with who are the leaders of these particular countries at this moment. But, and I once was listening to the President Tusk, President of the European Commission, who said uh, it was regarding the different kinds of crisis in, in Europe, that currently the intellectuals, they all speaking about the f problems and the issues that the governments have, but are not really proposing also any kind of vision. Mm. Uh, so, of course, there are the leaders, there is a vacuum of power, but the intellectuals just, you know, more more or less, give an assessment, it is, but don't propose anything. So what would well, be the, 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 your because idea? Because the visions require are dangerous. I mean, so my vision would be that Europe should begin to have a, you know, have, begin to have its own foreign and security strategy, and that it should see, you know, your, its sphere of um, its sphere of activity as Eastern Europe and North Africa. And it should think in terms of, you know, spreading stability into those regions. And it should take them seriously, you know, that it's, you know, Ukraine, um, uh, Ukraine, I mean, perhaps one day Moldova, perhaps one day Georgia, um, and, you know, you know, Tunisia and the other countries with whom it's possible to cooperate in North Africa. But it seems and begin like, to take mm -hmm. them seriously, support stability there. Work, you, know, the, the, you know, after the bombardment of Libya, and believe me, I went to Libya three times, there was no, you know, there was, there was no serious European effort to help promote stability in Libya. Lessons that had been learned in other places following other civil wars were not applied. You know, people, the, the, the government of Gaddafi fell and then everybody left. Mm -hmm. Um, which is exactly what we did in Afghanistan after the after the after the Russians left. It's exactly what's happened in several other places. But it's, it's just like when nobody yeah. learns the lessons of of, uh, of the past. But what is it? Because it seems like part of it is fundamentally not wanting to think of things in terms of influence. You know, Russia saw Ukraine in terms of Western influence expanding, mm. and the EU didn't even have that much interest. They no. were worried about them trying to join and get larger. So I mean, with is a that, few exceptions. In with the a EU. few exceptions, okay. Mm. But I mean, what does that create? Especially as you're mentioning, in many of these countries, it means people take some action and then disappear. Yes, yes, that's exactly what it means. That there's a little bit done, and then somebody gets distracted by something else, and you know there's a there's a little small effort made, um, and then and then you know pe people forget it, or people are, are afraid to put too many eggs in one basket. I mean, I've heard it argued about Ukraine. Um, I heard this argument in Washington. You know, we don't want to put too much money in Ukraine because probably it will all be wasted. And it will all disappear, and it will be, you know, it will be stolen, and um, you know they're going to be taken over by the Russians again anyway, eventually. So why are we putting any effort into it? I mean, that's a, I'm, I'm exaggerating a little bit, but that's kind of a, you know, there's a sort of there's the also another thing happening, which is important post Iraq in particular. There is a there's a real lack of confidence in many Western capitals, even about our ability to do useful things in other countries. I mean, I don't, I'm not even talking about military intervention, but, you know, even our ability to help to stabilize or our ability to promote democracy. You know, we have a, we had a lot of confidence after 1989, and that's really disappeared. I, you know, another thing, uh, you know, during the, particularly at the beginning of the Syrian crisis, I had a lot of Syrians ask me, you know, why doesn't the United States help us? You know, there are moderate Syrians. You know, there are Syrians who want democracy. Why don't, why don't you help us? Is it because you don't like Syria? And I said, no, no, it has nothing to do with that. Um, it's because the, nobody in the West, and people said this to me, in London or Washington, nobody had the confidence that we know what to do. There was no... There was no sense that you know we here's what our policy. Is. So, so there really, what created, there's been no policy in yeah. Syria at all. Since but what's the war the, where is this crisis of confidence coming from? Is it from the Afghan it's war, from the Iraq war? Partly, where? Yes, partly it's from the Iraq war, and partly it's from the economic crisis, which sort of dented the West's confidence in its its own system. And what are the answers to that? You know, just we again can sit and discuss how bad the things are, but then somebody have to create the vision. Somebody has to. Well, you know, I mean, I you know, I can I can create a vision for you, and I can put it. On, on paper, but I need someone to enact it. I mean, what, what we do need is to is is political leaders who are willing to, you know, take these risks. And it's, you know, by by taking a risk like that, it's very easy to lose your job. Or you know, to and and you mentioned all this discussion um, in the U.S. from uh, about Ukraine. So the money would be wasted and all the mm. things. We also discussed that it would be a kind of a martial plan to Ukraine could work, and probably this IMF package. It's not exactly what it is, but this is a substantial support. It's, a big, it's big, the IMF package, actually. And uh, so, um, and your uh, assessment of that, so uh, you said you've, it's over
uh, exaggerated. It's exaggerated, this discussion that the money anyway would be wa wasted mm -hmm. and Ukraine would be in the Russian sphere of influence. But from the way you follow what's happening here, um, do you think it's like that? And what are the no, risks? I, no. So, uh, you know, I don't want to, I don't want to, I'm not here all the time and I'm not reporting here. So I don't, yeah. I'm not going to tell you what to think about the country that you know much better than I do. But um, no, it's clear to me that there are people and there are institutions which can be funded in Ukraine. Um, and there are business opportunities. And I know it because I have friends in Poland and London who are interested in investing here. And so there is, you know, they're, they're clearly, you know, as you, as you were saying to me before, before we started, you know, this is not the same kind of government as we had three years ago. Um, it's not a perfect government, but there are, th there are clearly things that have changed, and there's clearly an effort being made. And it's, it's, you know, it's possible to, you know, if you try, you can find, um, you know, you can find places to invest. So, so, so no, I don't think it will all be wasted. And from the from your experience following the reforms after different kind of during the times of transition in Eastern Europe, so what are still the biggest risks apart from a general world corruption? I mean, generally speaking, as I understand it, and this is not I haven't spent a lot of time studying you know the legal system in Ukraine. I mean, I think you have a you know you have a you have one set of problems which is to do with administrative regulation and the diffi you know difficulties you know a lot of corruption can be eliminated by just eliminating by simplifying the law you know if you sim if you have very simple laws then it's hard to twist them um, having a very simple tax system you know having a very simple um, VAT system, even if you have that at all, but simplifying legislation and making life easier for both ordinary people and for businesses eliminates a lot of corruption immediately. You know, because you don't need to you don't need a bureaucrat to to help you do something. You can just do it. So that's you know that's one very obvious um, you know that's one that's one obvious thing to do. And the second thing is. Um, you know, second thing would be privatization in a in a way that I mean nobody's ever really happy with the results of privatization. But um, taking as much, you know, taking as much um, pro you know property and industry out of state hands, um, and you know find, finding a way to privatize in a you know that doesn't that doesn't wind up in that's not oligarchization once again. Um, that would be really important. Uh, really important thing to do. All right. Well, thank you so much for joining us and giving us some more insight. I'm always well, really uh, delighted to be here. Thank you very much. And yeah, thanks. And uh, probably would, you would learn more while being in Ukraine and probably see it with your own eyes. <laughs> that sometimes matters. Now, as we mentioned before, we wanted to take a closer look at Malaysia Airlines flight MH17 that was shot down. Uh, the Dutch Safety Board released a new report this week. Uh, there was some new information there, but it also didn't go as far as some people would like. They identified it as having been shot down by a Russian-made Buk rocket, uh, and they identified that it had been shot from separatist-controlled territory. However, this report did not say who pulled the trigger, i.e. who is responsible for all of that. Now, they criticized the Ukrainians for not closing their airspace, and in response to this whole narrative, Russia created its own investigation that seemed mainly, mainly intended to divert attention from the Dutch investigation. Russia had previously vetoed in the UN Security Council an attempt to create a UN-based investigation. Retrieved fragments and traces of paint point to a missile carrying a... Hi, thanks. That is B-roll. Okay. Um, so we are sorting out. That was a bit of the video we wanted also to show while about the Dutch report, uh, which explains how MH17 was shot down. Um, so that's you can uh, watch now. Also, there is a... 19-minute video, uh, which was made by the uh, Dutch experts, so that you definitely can find on the web page of the Dutch Safety Board to see this uh, exact explanation, and as well, 
um, what we really know um, and what Ian, my colleague, has already said, that um, it's clear that it was shot from the book missile. Uh, but coming back to studio, um, uh, we here in Ukraine uh, have also the uh, different uh, story to broadcast to you and to uh, let you watch. Um, um, our colleagues, our Hromadsky co correspondent went to uh, Grabovo. This is a village uh, where uh, the debris are still there and already a year um, after and a year and a couple of months um, they again talk to the local res residents and ask um, what they see and what can find on the uh, place of the crash. Ходили люди і спрашивали, хто бачив. А? Ми, я ж кажу, що ми побачили, вже побачили, як бумага на це горить, то падає і клоч. І все. Туди ми одразу не пішли, тому що криві, сліпі, що ми туди підемо. А мені кажеться, що вони вже його шукають і ні як не мають. Одне на одне. a chance to um, talk to the European politician, uh, there was a question by um, after this release, so what would happen next? Because it was all the technical report and what would happen with the criminal case? Because well, it's not over. I mean, that's yeah, the because the question would be like, what happened after this one year of the, um, you know, um, yeah, there is a report, but what is the next? So in order to uh, clarify, at least from the political point of view, what, are the what could be the political consequences, uh, we managed managed to talk to the German politician and the president of the Greens European uh, Free Alliance uh, group in the European Parliament, Rebecca Harms, who, um, sh who let us know about her vision on that. There are no, it's a technical report, there are no names of the perpetrators, so we do not see what are the political consequences, I mean, it's a different report, but, so what are the results, what is the meaning of these reports today? I think, first of all, it's important to know uh, it was a Russian warhead. Uh, this uh, was obviously proven uh, by this uh, report, as I understand it. Uh, it's uh, not only a technical question, it matters for clarification who is responsible uh, for the killing of uh, 298 people. Uh, because 298 people died in MH17, this should not be forgotten. Uh, and uh, also, for me, it's important uh, by showing uh, the real case, building the case uh, about who was behind, to prepare a court case uh, because this has been a war crime and war crimes have to have consequences. We've heard about uh, the fact that the criminal investigation would be in the beginning of 2016 and might be even prolonged till the end of the 2016, so what uh, we can expect from that. So I think, uh, like after all wars, and I hope we will be able also on Donbas to say after the war, yeah, but after every war, 
uh, those who have committed war crimes should be brought to court. And I expect that the criminal investigation will uh, pave the way for this. So there's again and again uh, the debate uh, coming back. When uh, Bellingcat and uh, Mr. Higgins presented their report uh, only a few uh, time ago, uh, we also had discussions on the consequences and, uh, for example, I myself, when I read uh, the uh, recommendations in Minsk agreement uh, for uh, so the uh, amnesty, amnesty of um, many who have been fighters uh, in uh, Donbas war, uh, so I think uh, it's really important uh, that the amnesty will not be approved for those who are responsible for these uh, incredible uh, war crimes. Ian, um, you've had a conversation with one of the journalists, Chris Miller, who had been on the crash site uh, right after the crash and recently. And so what, what was this conversation about and what we would see now? Well, I mean, it was interesting because he was there, I think, about a day later, and he was really there on the ground. And, you know, we're talking about the potential to investigate war crimes and to put it together. It's really journalists who played the, that first role in collecting information. A lot of people from the OSC, from other organizations, couldn't get there later. Uh, with Chris, it's interesting because he's been there so, so many times, gathered information, spoken to the locals. So we talked about that. We talked about this counter campaign from Russia, trying to change the narrative. You know, the uh, company that creates these rockets that's been identified had put together their own report. Russian media had claimed that these two reports were the same, <laughs> trying to misdirect information that way. So that was interesting. And the nice bit is at the end, we spoke a little bit about his observations in Ukraine. He was here for over five years, will be coming through again, but won't be based here for a little And while. I also know that uh, his name and his data had been used at the Bellingcat report, in particular his photos and some kind of his uh, journalistic material in order to add up. Well, I mean, I think, you know, with that, it was important because there, there were so many people there at this crash site, and for a long time there was nothing restricting people from what they could go and move. So I think those early journalist images and documentation really provided evidence about how things were right after the crash that could be used. Anyway, we can go to that now and uh, let people see that interview. Well, I don't think the, the outcome of the report is uh, very surprising. I, mean, I think we, what we expected to hear was exactly what the report said, which was a uh, Russian boot missile uh, down MH17. Um, you know, of course, the interesting thing and the big political question, at least, is, uh, you know, who the trigger, so to speak, and of course that wasn't answered in this report. Um, you know, I think one one interesting element of the report was uh, the blame it laid on Ukraine for not closing its airspace prior um, to uh, July 17th, when more than a dozen other aircraft were shot down with surface-to-air missiles, and um, you know the Dutch saying that there was sufficient reason enough to actually close the airspace. I mean, it seems like. It because they don't say who pulled, you know, pulled the trigger, that's the big question moving forward. But it seems to at least have shut down some of the Russian versions of what happened, which was that it was a Ukrainian military plane that shot down the Malaysia Airlines flight, those things. And what can you say about that and also the Russian response to this report? Sure. Well, for, for, for a lot of people, uh, the families in particular, I think this provides a level of closure um, and answers some questions, but not, not, not all of them. Uh, certainly the international audience will look at this report as the kind of be-all, end-all um, uh, to... Uh, uh, the incident, but the Russians, of course, are not are, are not going to accept this. And you saw with the Almazanti, uh, the Russian missile makers press conference the same day, actually even preceding the Dutch uh, the Dutch presentation uh, well, in was, Moscow. Someone was tweeting also that you know they were posting as if it was the same thing that the Dutch report and their report were the same. Yeah, yeah. There was a really great headline on uh, the Sputnik um, website, uh, which is one of the state-run uh, news sites um, that said that the results of the Dutch report had been the same as uh, the uh, Almazanti uh, report, which was obviously com uh, completely false. Um, but, you know, what we saw with uh, the Almazanti um, uh, presentation was this, like, really um, 
high-tech presentation of slide after slide um, with uh, you know all kinds of information that the layman would not understand and what I'd say would be just an attempt to muddy the water further um, even more so than they have done the Russian media that is over the last 16 months um, you know when it comes to MH17. I mean, do you think they feel threatened by it? Because there's also momentum to create something at the UN to investigate it, and that was something Russia shut down. Why is this such an important issue to Russia? Well, certainly Russia doesn't want to be blamed for this. Um, and, you know, in using their veto power in the Security Council in the UN, they've, they've showed that they don't want to have uh, blame fall on them, right? I and mean, that's, that's the whole point in them vetoing this. They don't want the blame to fall on Russia. Um, you know, them muddying the waters and coming up with all of these extravagant stories as to what exactly shot down the plane is all, is all part of that. Uh, Russian media has played a huge role in that over the last 16 months. So what, what can we expect from the next report? And, you know, what sort of closure would that give? Yeah, so, uh, you know, the report that everybody is waiting for is um, uh, the uh, Dutch detective report that will come out either at the end of this year or early next year that uh, will assign blame to this. So, um, you know, sometime in, in, in the upcoming months, we don't know when exactly, as I mentioned, uh, you know, Dutch investigators will go a step further and say who they believe is responsible. Um, my sources in uh, the Dutch investigation have said that um, they have a short list of people um, that they're looking looking at. Um, they've not released any names. Um you know they've 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 hinted um, in saying uh, with with the actual actually the uh, the Dutch safety board chairman saying after the press conference the other day that the launch site was in an area controlled by the Donetsk People's Republic. Um, you know this is an indication that they're going to lay blame probably to this to, to this side, the separatists or or Russia, and we'll see you know exactly what kind of language they're going to use. Um, well, yeah, I and mean, that's the way it's leaning because they said it's a Russian-made book and it was fired from separatist exactly. controlled territory. Exactly, exactly. I mean, so you can draw your own conclusions, I think, uh, from, from, you know, based on what we know. And I mean, uh, when we talk about war crimes, I mean, if they identify people in the next report, is there a next step? Is there a legal recourse? They're still trying to figure that out. Um, obviously, uh, Kiev and uh, the, the, the Dutch, uh, the British, and, and those who also lost people um, on AMH 17 are looking to create a military, or, I'm sorry, a criminal tribunal to prosecute those responsible. It's been held up in the UN uh, because of Russia's uh, veto in the Security Council. Uh, I mean, certainly um, there are people who want this to be um, uh, a, a war crime, and those uh, responsible brought the justice. How exactly that's going to happen, um, I mean, I, you know, I, I can't, I can't say. Um, it's still something that's being, it's being ironed out. Yeah, I don't think anyone can. Yeah. And I mean, you've been here for over five years now. I'm sure you'll be coming back, but it doesn't look like Kiev will be your base for the foreseeable future. This has been an incredibly personal story for you. I mean, you have been in Peace Corps in eastern Ukraine, and then in Kiev for a while. And what, what kind of a legacy has all this left for you? And how do you relate you know, to MH17 or all to the other all the other tragedies that have happened in Ukraine? Yeah, I mean certainly MH17 was, uh, you know, probably uh, the. Because um, you were there on the ground very shortly after the crash. Right? I, I I arrived 36 hours after the uh, crash. I was actually there the day before and had come back to Kiev on the train, and then I just turned around and went straight back. I mean I, I think that was probably the most difficult and. Um, most difficult story to report, and certainly, um, certainly a very emotional and politically charged story as well. Uh, there were several, several reasons why it was it was a difficult story to write. Um, but you know, the journalists it, were invaluable there because they were really the first people who could get information to the outside world about what had happened. Yeah, you know, Russia, Russia said, in, um, I think just, just this morning or yesterday, that Dutch investigators, um, you know, refused to go to the site. Um, you know, why did they refuse to go if OSCE was on the ground? Well, you know, myself and other journalists were there, and we saw very clearly that people were not allowed um, to, uh, you know, be on the site. Um, the OSCE was only allowed, I think, more than 24 hours or 36 hours after, and they were told to stay on the road, not actually go into the fields where they could further investigate, uh, you know, what had happened. Um, so access was limited. You know, to, answer, to go back and answer your question, I mean, being here for five years, I mean, certainly um, I've seen quite a bit. The last two years have been um, uh, un unbelievable in every kind of imaginable way. Um, I think, you know, with the ceasefire being largely in place right now, um, you know, the next step is going to be this kind of process of peace and reconciliation between people, people who supported 
the DNR and the LNR and people who have supported Kiev and, and Ukrainian forces in this, in this fight. And that's going to be a very, very long and uh, challenging process, to say the least. Now, as you can tell from that interview, a big issue with MH17 moving forwards is closure. Now, what's made that harder is the fact that the United Nations hasn't been a possible vehicle for granting that closure. A big part of that has been Russia's veto in the UN Security Council. This week, however, Ukraine had a major victory in that area. Ukraine was voted in as a temporary member of the Security Council. It won't have a veto, but will be in a better position to present its views and bring up topics that are important. To it. So uh, with that, we can um, actually shortly look how it was. <laughs> A bit of video from the UN. By, by member state, Ukraine, 177. quickly tonight. Uh, as I mentioned before, we also wanted to talk about the position of the far right in Ukrainian society. Uh, and to that extent, we sent our correspondents out into the field, out into the streets of Kiev, uh, to talk to Ukrainians about their views of the far right, whether or not they consider them a threat, and whether or not they think they're growing in influence. We have that for you now. What are you waiting for? Uh popularity of far right in upcoming elections? I think it will be maybe 10 or less percent. I don't think that this part is uh, for people. Today the national movement has had a revival. It has evolved into a new stage. I always looked at the more extremist groups with caution, but when people love their fatherland, that is normal. Uh, move, uh, right movement uh, um, began to rise up, and it uh, became uh, some more and more popularity. Uh, they are good for the state patriotism. They are for the state. We need some nationalistic movement, even not a nationalistic, but patriotic movement. In this meaning, I like Boreza much more. I think that far-right parties in Ukraine are not that popular at all. Some people will vote for them, but not that huge. Uh, Auditorium. If people are thinking about nationalism as a reason to go and fire something nearby the parliament, it will not be popular. But if people understand that they are responsible for their country, that they are not indifferent, not only about their house, their property, but on all what is going around us in our country, and this meaning of nationalism, it has a lot of support. So part of the reason we wanted to talk about this topic is because there was a far-right march this week, but it overlaps with a lot of different days. You have the Defenders of the Fatherland Day, which started in the Soviet Union and was moved. You also have the founding of UPA, and you also have a Cossack holiday connected with the military and with the Virgin Mary. So, Natalka, as our resident Ukrainian, what, what the heck is going it's on? It's confusing because, yeah, we've, we've selected this topic about why there was this uh, far-right march, but it's all confusing because there is an old orthodox holidays of the Holy Mary, which mm -hmm. is kind of the protector of all the warriors since decades, decades, decades. And obviously this orthodox holiday hadn't been in, uh, during the Soviet times, it uh, wasn't considered a holiday. And then it was kind of a special day for any Ukrainian fighter. And the, during Second World War and after, uh, it became a day of the Ukrainian Patriotic Army, which fought both uh, Soviet and the Nazi during the Second World War, and again, had been forbidden 
uh, during the Soviet times. So uh, during the independence, some of the far right or some of the nationalists, you know, use it as its own holiday. Uh, but uh, instead of having the Red Army Soviet holiday as Ukraine used to have, um, the day of the Ukrainian army, or of the Soviet army and the Russian army, we just had the one on the day of the kind of a defender of the motherhood. So, but it was definitely partly co-opted by the uh, different uh, ultra-conservative here. And that's what we uh, talked about with Anton Shehavtsov, who is a visit visiting senior fellow at the Legatum Institute, one of the best researchers on the far right in Ukraine, Russia, and uh, Eastern Europe at all. So uh, he explained what is, uh, how the things are connected with, with uh, what is happening on the street and how, uh, what is the influence of the street to the uh, politic. To the politics. This is a traditional event for the far right. Uh, they have gathered on the 14th of October every year for, for, for a number of years already. Uh, but at the same time, the, the amount of people who came to the march, it was quite impressive. As far as I understand, there were from two to, to 3,000 people. And I think this is the most... Um, um, no significant event in, 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 in terms of size, at least. And how do you feel the situation with far right after the latest attacks nearby the parliament? Obviously, Svoboda is now trying to recover its image because it, it did suffer a lot after the grenade was thrown at the National Guards. And now it is trying to, again, uh, position themselves as the most radical opposition to, to Poroshenko. They did this with Yanukovych. They also tried to show the population that they were mo the most radical opposition to Yanukovych. And now they're attempting the same thing with, uh, with Poroshenko. And it was the, the major message of the march. Uh, it was quite anti-systemic, anti-establishment, anti-government. Do you feel, do you think that the government has the strategy to deal with the far right in Ukraine now? Um, no, I don't think that um, the state has the, a clear strategy. Of course, the police and the security services, they're trying to monitor the situation. They know most of these people and uh, perhaps even trying to somehow influence uh, their activities, but there is no clear strategy towards them. And um, as we can see, uh, the, the grenade by the Ukrainian parliament, it was a failure of the security services to know in advance that things such as this could, could happen. And do you see a difference between far right in Ukraine and Russia? Uh, there are some obvious uh, differences and there are obvious similarities. Similarities are that uh, the far right in general, not only in, in Ukraine or in Russia, it's very populist. It's usually against the government. And the most radical elements of the Russian far right, they're also against uh, Putin's regime. Uh, there are, of course, many far-right groups that support Putin's regime, but still, the most radical, most extremist organizations, they, they're against it. Uh, the same we have here in Ukraine, where the far-right would be against the government, against the establishment. Uh, but there are also many differences. Of course, this is... Uh, the Ukrainian far-right is largely anti-Russian. Uh, not necessarily a against the Russian people as an ethnic group, but against Moscow's policies, against the official Kremlin. 
but um, in terms of ideas, if we just take aside all the um, all the issues about the enemies, who is the enemy for uh, for the Ukrainian or Russian far right? There are many similar. Uh, there are many. Uh, uh, Again, similarities between them. They are against gays. They are quite um, skeptical or even critical about the West, about the um, U.S. in particular. So there are many similarities. And could we analyze it as a general trend for all Europe, or at least central? Or even? Yes, there are central points, and this is the reason why we refer to those groups as far-right groups, because there are clear ideological similarities similarities between them. They all belong to one far-right family, so to say. And this is true for even for the US and, and for Europe as well, of course. And is it possible to build some connection between them at an interstate level or not? Uh, there were contacts between the Ukrainian far-right and the European far-right parties, but uh, they all ended in 2013, 2014 when most of the far-right groups in the West started to support uh, Putin's Russia rather than Ukraine. And that led to alienation between uh, the Western far-right and the Ukrainian far-right. But at the same time, the, the Ukrainian far-right, they are still trying to, to cooperate. And they do cooperate with some groups from Poland, for example. But this is a very limited cooperation. It's interesting about Poland because actually, like a, a centrist uh, of Ukrainian far radicals, they have been quite rivals with uh, Polish. Yes, sometimes, but sometimes historical differences can be just uh, taken aside. And uh, for example, some Slovak groups they support the right sector, for example. Yeah. Uh, there are also some contexts uh, uh, context between the Russian uh, far right and the Ukrainian far right, and some um, some members of the uh, right wing movements in Russia they come to Ukraine and fight uh, against the Russian backed separatists. And you know about this uh, gathering of Russian nationalists in Kiev? Uh, how do you feel about it? Well, it's I think it's a, even a normal situation where you have many people uh, from Russia uh, being loyal to the Ukrainian state who they all gather here and they decide to do something about this and they decided to build this group. And who is the social base for Ukrainian far rights at the moment? Well these are mostly young people in their teens and their 20s and 30s who feel disaffected, who feel alienated from uh, the um, from the democratic processes in Ukraine and who feel that the war is something that they waited for a very long time about fighting because the far right is uh, ideologically is already quite an aggressive movement and uh, the war is something natural for them. But uh, speaking about the war, uh, we can see a lot of connections between like a uh, war ideology now and Svoboda ideology or they use this uh, new generation of uh, veterans and warriors, do they? Yes, they're trying, obviously they're trying to influence uh, soldiers and officers who take part in the anti-terrorist operation. And uh, there are some volunteer battalions uh, that's quite explicit about uh, their own ideology. Or at least, as far as I understand, there are, they are trying to recruit new members uh, from even uh, non-political uh, volunteer battalions and uh, especially rank and file from the Ukrainian army.
right, so we also wanted to look at a specific incident that involved the far right. Here in Kiev, you have a famous cinema uh, called Zhovtan, uh, that last year when a LGBT-themed film was being showed as part of a film festival, was attacked. Uh, there's a great deal of damage from fire, and uh, Natalka, maybe you can tell us a little bit about where no, it went from there. No, but what's happening now today is reopening of the cinema. It's an iconic cinema for all the uh, residents of Kiev for many years because it's, it's running all the independent movies in the time when uh, all cinemas are very commercialized. It managed to stay in the center of Kiev to show not the blockbusters, but a lot of good stuff. Even films in English? In the even original. films in English. So for any kind of person who cares, even if, at least a bit about culture here, it's like a big, um, a big day to day because the cinema is reopened and it has been rebuilt with the uh, money of the volunteers, of the Kiev residents, of uh, different, different people, and everybody who wants wanted to, you know, help, could really pay something to get the, um, a seat with the name either of a company or of a personality. So with that, within one year, the cinema is rebuilt and probably would be even more iconic. Uh, but we can watch uh, the teaser of our shot documentary our colleague Bogdan Kutyepov has shot, uh, devoted to the, uh, one of the, definitely the best cinemas in Ukraine. channel and to follow Hromatske webpage en.hromatske.tv so you can uh, watch uh, the full uh, reports uh, the, uh, and uh, get more than we have during this Sunday show. All right, and now to move to our other big topic. As you know, we here are very often talking about reforms almost as much as the politicians. Continues to be a big issue moving forward. We sent our correspondents onto the street to also ask Ukrainians how they're feeling about reforms and progress in making them happen. Do you feel reforms in your life after the Maidan? No, nothing. No? I don't feel anything. But you would like? <laughs> of course. Of course not. What are you talking about? What kind of reform? No, I don't feel them. During Yanukovych's regime, those criminals stole everything. And now we have people who love golden cows. Something in our mind changed, so uh, we started with uh, started such as, such as one piece, and uh, people now understand what uh, happened in our country. They feeling some national idea, and it's very good. So I hope it, uh, we have, we will have a peace in our country, and uh, it will be great for all us. I'm reading about reforms after my down on my Facebook, but. Um, I don't uh, f feel it uh, truly uh, on my real life. I see the new police car, um, new policemen with uh, uh, fine clothes and uh, shiny um, badges, and, uh, but uh, I don't feel uh, something really important for me. I feel uh, uh, reforms, but... Uh it would be better than uh, it will be uh, occupied much more spheres of our life. I'm waiting for reforms with impatience. I would like to see some results of our sacrifices. I don't want Maidan to be in vain. 
Ну, не даремно, не даремно. They said not so quickly, but there are. And you are ready to wait for them? A bit, yes. Then later we'll see. I don't want second Maidan. I would like to see reforms and the country move forward. I'm a person with a lot of patience. I've lived in this country for a long time, and I'm ready to wait for a better future. A lot of things have been changed in the country after Maidan, and we are hoping for a better reality. But the situation in the country is quite tough, so everybody is just waiting. Yes, of course. <laughs> I feel a lot of changes, but I think it's uh, very bad times, but uh, it, it was the right steps, and that's why we agree with this. That's what people think, but probably there could be different answers from the politicians. You know, um, Ian, you've interviewed the deputy head of the president administration of Ukraine, Dmitry Shimkiv, who is partly responsible for the reforms. He was the head of Microsoft here mm -hmm. before that, uh, before the Maidan revolution. And um, with your discussion, was he persuasive? Have he persuaded you about the way they are dealing with well, changing, change in the country? What I like to remember was saying he was talking about his work on the National Reform Council, which tracks you know, how these different reforms are moving ahead. And what I liked is he admitted some have moved all right, and a whole lot of them haven't moved at all. And he was talking about their efforts to put pressure on people and say, hey, you agreed to do this, now you need to actually do it. So I thought that was a, a good approach to it. And what I liked is he was very open in discussing it, which is a nice thing to see. But we'll let our viewers decide and go to that interview now. We need, when, we, when we're talking about the reforms in Ukraine, we lo we're talking about a, a, a set of a lot of complexity. Over the 24 years, the reforms were uh, done in some areas, some areas not. Actually, in many areas, it was um, opposite direction because the ugliness of the system uh, been built over the time. So there, is, there are areas where there's, we've done many things which are currently generating positive stories. First but, positive mm -hmm. story is police. Everybody mm -hmm. knows, right? Uh, police on the streets of Kiev, selfie with the police officers is very popular. Second is um, uh, procurement, electronic procurement system, Prozora, which started as an initiative that I, start, I proposed at the, con on, at, the, at the meeting. And then activists, we start building this, and we now it's now run full full stream by Max Nifyodov, who is the leader of this reform now. So it's, how does that work? Explain to our viewers how that oh, works. Oh, it's and very it's simple. Reform. When we started the idea, uh, you know, uh, changing legislation can take six to nine months in Ukraine, so it diverges, and it's a normal process. And everybody talks about legislation changes and proving that things can do well in the procurement. And uh, when I was sitting at this round table, says, why don't we? start and show to everybody that electronic system can work and can solve the problem with decreasing the price for the area which is gray zone or kind of white field. So where the, basically mm -hmm. the place where tenders, you don't need to run tender if you are procuring under 100,000 grievances. Before now it's 200,000 and uh, 1 million of services. So it's an it's, uh, area where we, this is a niche, we propose to run electronic system. What it means, you go online, you register your private entrepreneur or a small company or big company, and a government or a government agencies bid, put a bid. They would like to procure paper. You go online, you bid. At the same time, another person logs in and bid. And they don't see their names, but they see their bids. Okay, so it's transparency. So it's a transparency. So, so, so they that. get a bit, a bit, a bit, and then there is a timing given for a round. When it's done, everybody see the names. So what role is internet playing in fighting corruption in Ukraine oh, right now? I would say digitalization. Digitalization is a vital and one of the most advanced 
tool globally, in, and Ukraine particularly, that shed light and transparency of everything. A lot of people are not happy with the transparency. Why? When petitions started and when the president launched electronic petitions, basically we, we have a list. If you look at the top 20, it's a top 20 issues that people are concerned about. And it's a lot about anti-corruption, courts, etc. So it's a very, again, digital tool. When we're talking about electronic procurement, it's electronic procurement which allow us to save millions, already millions of grievances in the real procurement. Uh, when we're talking today about open data and the project that Ministry of Finance launched was eData, where you can actually see every transaction that's taking place today uh, with the uh, Treasury. That's transparency. It's very difficult to hide when things are sh uh, there is a, the sun is shining. You know, my favorite phrase is, uh, when the cockroaches are running around, when you shed light, they run away. And that's so it's similar with corruption <laughs> in Ukraine? No, no, absolutely, because when you introduce technology and the full transparency in the whole process, mm -hmm. some people hate electronic document flow. Why? Because it's transparent. I can calculate how many uh, documents you processed. I can tell how long you processed this document. You cannot play the tricks that you, the document's been lost. No, it's been possible to trace. You can clearly see when it is, who is responsible, why that document is sitting here, and why you're not performing. And I think that's something I have to explain. I mean, for our viewers who haven't been to Ukraine, there's a lot of send me a formal letter, send me this, that's been lost. Oh, could this you please sign processed. it on the back of the document? Visuvanya is a put in your uh, signature on the documents. Uh, it's interesting, there is no law that requires that. But everybody has a rule of kind of confirmation that you read the document, you sign it at the back, basically called shared responsibility or shared irresponsibility for the proposal. And this is absolutely different when you're talking about digitization. Mm -hmm. When you look in today in the global world, digitization is one of the first steps that actually made the world transparent. What is the role of the National Reform Council, Council in making ministries responsible for reforms and government bodies, and how do they hold people accountable? Ministers and uh, government is responsible for reform by design, by constitution, by laws. What we do as a National Reform Council, we actually, because we have president, cabinet of ministers, parliament, and civil society, we put them at the table to have a deep discussion about any particular reform, mm -hmm. drilling very, very deep. It's interesting because everybody looks at the National Reform Council just at the moment of meeting, but there is a lot of work done pre-meeting, preparing, structuring, uh, understanding key problems, possible solutions, and all this is accumulated structures and brought to the meeting. Then we have a very deep discussion about the problem from the key stakeholders in the country. So, okay, but I have to play devil's advocate Hold here. on. Okay. Then all there right, is a follow-up. Right. So then there is a follow-up. I haven't finished. I'm waiting. And the follow-up, the decision that are made at the National Reform Council, mm -hmm. then, then we are tracing them. If we decided that this law needs to be submitted mm -hmm. and reviewed, we're tracking who is submitting. If somebody needs to present to the fraction of coalition, we make sure and we encourage that the meeting takes place. If there is a conflict, we're trying to facilitate the discussion. Because there could be, on any reforms, we usually have at least two opinions. And they used to be different. And they can be in cabinet, and the parliament, the presidential administration, they can be any place, or civil society. Mm -hmm. So one of the key challenges today in Ukraine, that there could be two opinions that people are fighting against each other. All right, well, we're keeping moving tonight. As we get to the later part of our program, we have another uh, special interview for you with American author Gary Steingard, author of Absurdistan and uh, also Little Failure. We've and uh, Gary had been uh, with us on Skype after he had done this incredible um, report on consuming Russian television for a week. And, and after that, he'd written that he wants to know something different for in Ukraine, come and see something not not just politics, not about the politicians, not about Russia, but just really some softer stories. And you managed to talk to him as well, of course. Um, so have he managed really to find something different from what he has uh, seen in the media and something which makes him interested in the place? 
Well, I think he's seen something different from what he knew. He mentioned that in his childhood he'd been in Kiev very briefly, moving on to Crimea. But he was trying to hit spots that were less commonly traveled. So going to Chernobyl, but also going to Mezhihiria, to Yanukovych's former residence. Uh, one thing I have to say, the guy has a great sense of humor, so it was great getting to see Ukraine through his eyes. And we'll share that for all of you now. All right, so now we're joined by author Gary Steingart, author of Absurdistan and also um, the Russian Debutant's Handbook and also the, your recent uh, memoir, Little Failure. Thank you so much for joining us. Great to be here in Kiev. So what brought you here this time? Well, what are you doing? <laughs> what am I doing here? I hear you're visiting the ni all the nicest corners, the I top am. tourist spots. At the top, I went to Pripyat. I, I saw the... Russian woodpecker, the dattel, that famous array. Um, I think. And Pripyat, so Chernobyl, right? Chernobyl, yes, Chernobyl. Um, my next book has ten different locations. And, Can you uh, say the ten or some of them? Yes. Uh, so we start in uh, Bangkok, Beijing, Shanghai, Bombay, uh, Seoul. Uh, then we go to Salvador de Bahia in Brazil, Havana, Cuba. Uh, Berlin, and then Kiev and Chernobyl area, and then the North Pole. Did it start off as a book about cities that start with the letter B, and then you got bored? <laughs> right, right. Um, yeah, first it was uh, uh, Shanghai, Bomb Mumbai, Dubai, but then I got rid of Dubai. So, okay. <laughs> um, so things that end with I. Um, so nonfiction then? Nonfiction, no, no, it's fiction. Fiction, uh, it's okay. Fiction. Yeah, yeah. Um, and uh, as opposed to most of my books, there's a, it's not the usual kind of Russian-Jewish narrator. It's actually an attractive woman in her 30s. So I'm hoping to get a, <laughs> a, a Russian-Jewish person, a it's woman, a, could be attractive. No, no, no. It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a Korean-Canadian woman. Oh, so I see. It's, okay. very, it's a big leap this for me. It's a big step for big you. Step for me. To new territory. Yes, yes, new territory. <laughs> so, I mean, what drew you to those places in Ukraine? I mean, there are a lot of people that kind of do that sort of tourism, especially Chernobyl. has been big for a long time. Oh, it's great. I mean, Chernobyl was absolutely fascinating. Um, first of all, as a time lapse into... I mean, I grew up, I was born in Leningrad, and I moved when I was seven, but... So did Chernobyl remind you of home? Well, the, the children's books, you know, everything is preserved, the, you know... The radioactive children's uh, books, The yeah. children's books, <laughs> <laughs> all those signs about, you know, the, the next CS, the next uh, party congress, uh, all that nonsense is, is perfectly preserved, and, and it's not nostalgia per se, but it's this fascinating window into something that doesn't really exist. But not just that, but the whole massiveness of it, the, 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 the antenna, the Russian woodpecker, the Duga, the over-horizon antenna is fascinating to see. It's 50 meters tall, 150 meters wide. Nobody builds things like that anymore. But it also uh, doesn't work. It right? also doesn't it work. Works. Well, well, it's Soviet, of course, so it doesn't work. Uh, and it costs twice or whatever more than Chernobyl. And um, so anyway, these things are absolutely fascinating to me. Um, but I think you're right. I mean, no one builds on that scale anymore, even if it's not a successful project. You know, it's hard to convince people in the U.S., for example, to build a new highway. Right, right? A exactly. No, I mean, people do build. Like China, before the, their crisis mm -hmm. anyway, built uh, the Shanghai Sky, I mean, you go to Shanghai and there's 15 different metro lines that are popped up overnight, whereas we can't build in New York the Second Avenue subway for seven years. Hey, Hudson Yards, where we got it's something Hudson new. Hudson Yards, we got something new. Well, but, but we, build, we build for wealthy people. We don't build uh, infrastructure for, you know, this is a huge problem, I think, is that we, whereas China with a, you know, socialist government is able to say, well, now we're going to build a, you know, 30 subway lines and... What are you going to do? Get it all done. So what are your impressions of Ukraine on this trip? I mean, you're doing a little bit of a travel thing. There seems to be, I don't, I don't know if you call it a disaster port element, because you have There's Chernobyl some disaster port, there. Yeah, but, but Chernobyl actually is not as disastrous as, it's actually this beautiful space, um, because it's not, because it stopped. Uh, well, it was also, I mean, it was a model Soviet plan. Oh, it was amazing. Oh, no, we were talking, I was talking with, a, there was another Russian woman there, and we were talking about how we went to the supermarket, the, which, you know, we didn't have markets like that. We had the gastronom, you know, and, 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 but this was like a, almost a Western supermarket with dedicated aisles for beer and cheese. It was like Whole Foods. It was like Chernobyl Whole Foods or Pripyat Whole Foods. It was, it was very interesting. Um, so they actually lived in a much higher standard of living because I think they were special workers at the nuclear plant and, and stuff like that. So that part is interesting too. But, you know, just watching nature take over, that's the... 
that's the sort of, for me, that's the important. When there are all these studies about, there, there too seem to be two warring experts on this, I forget what the proper term is, but on nature, where one argues that man does more damage than radioactivity, so you have all these animals who are there and doing well, mm -hmm. and there's another one who argues that's all, that's all nonsense. <laughs> I don't know. I mean, I can't, uh, I can't attest to, um, I, I was told of the giant catfish that swim in the cooling water, the cooling tower water, but I think they were giant even before. Uh, and you caught one of them. I caught one of them and I ate it. Um, so, so, yeah, I take things seriously. I, I want to live. No, it was, so a, you know. You can kind of absorb the I place. I can absorb the place forever. Uh, no, it's a, you know, it's a, it, it really is amazing. And in a way, also traveling to Havana, uh, which sounds completely different from Chernobyl, but the idea that things have stopped, you know, you, you walk through Havana, your Wi-Fi doesn't work, American credit cards don't work, um, you're, law, you're isolated, but at the same time you're more alive. Everything around you is different. Uh, it hasn't been overrun, not just by uh, mankind, humanity, but, but by the social stuff and the, you know, the, the, the second layer of humanity, the internet uh, that exists everywhere. Uh, and so strolling through Havana in a way, strangely enough, reminded me a little bit, of, or strolling through, through Pipette and all that, Chernobyl reminded me of, of Havana, yeah. So, I mean, what's, what's your own connection to Ukraine? I know you said you were here once just when you were very small, but you also, part of your family was originally from Ukraine. Sure. Uh, they were from Chernovtsi, uh, near Kamispadolsk, I think. Uh, that was my father's side. Um, and they were a huge family. And I think they suffered everything, the, the Civil War. My uh, grandfather was killed by some gang, you know, and he was, uh, they owned a like a horse, an inn for horse travelers, whatever that's called, that uh, has a name in English, but I'm forgetting it. Um, and then the, when people were dying during the Holodomor, they were also affected, of course, by the, you know, and then, and then my grandmother made her way up from this Chernovtsi area. She made her way up to Leningrad, uh, and um, that's, that was her part of the family, and the other part is from um, Belarusia, from, um, from Belarus. Vitebsk, yeah, Belarus. Belarus. Yeah, yeah. So anyway, so, the, the, so there is that connection, but also we would vacation like good Soviet citizens in the Crimea, uh, in Gurzuf to be specific. Um, and those were, of course, very happy memories for me. Um, so, you know. But it's, it's ironic now that uh, I, I can't just get on a train and go to Gurzuf. Um, from Kiev. Like from Kiev. Um, you know, uh, I can land in, the, in Ukraine without any visa, but now to, to get to Crimea would require this whole, and I wouldn't want to support, the, you know, a lot of things are. Well, I mean, yeah, at least that's the legal way to go as opposed to people enter from Russia. And maybe one last question, since you're having all these impressions and you're here, as a writer, I mean, what's interesting to you about what's going on in Ukraine and Kiev now? Is there anything that's special or some, anything else that surprised you? I love the food here, and I was talking to a friend of mine who's a, a correspondent um, who's, ba who, who's, who's a Muscovite, and she said, the food was always better here uh, mm -hmm. than it was in Moscow or Petersburg, and it's true. You know, some of these restaurants, I mentioned Lubi Medyadze is one of my favorite restaurants in, anywhere in the post-Soviet space. Um, uh, the food is better somehow, uh, even little foods, you know, little piroshki here and there. Um, the bar scene is, is wonderful, it's really opening up. Um, Alchemist, uh, Budupoja is a great new bar that just opened. Um, the people feel less aggressive somehow. They feel uh, kinder, they're friendlier, much more easier for them to smile. Um, maybe that's always been a part of Ukraine versus Russia, but uh, it definitely feels very livable and very easy to be in, despite the, all the problems that obviously exist um, on, on a countrywide scale. As an American, they'll do small talk. And they'll they'll do joke with me. Yes. When I went to McDonald's to get a cup of coffee once, you know, I was saying, could I get something like Mojna blah, blah, blah. And she's, the woman said, well, what would you do if I said no? <laughs> and I said, uh, I was like, well, I guess I'd be sad. And she's yeah, yeah. like, all right, fine. You know, and whenever I get in a taxi in Moscow or Petersburg uh, from the airport, the the cab driver will always rail, oh, the Georgians in our courtyard are too loud, or these stupid Chechens, or these awful Tajiks, and this was the first time that the cab driver didn't complain about anybody. I thought that was a really good sign. It's a less xenophobic cab driver. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> All right, well, then we'll end on that note, we'll that's, that note. Exciting. <laughs> <laughs> that's exciting. That's <laughs> exciting. We won't get better than that. Thank yeah. you so much for Thank joining you. us. Thank you, absolutely.
and Romanski International joined the Solidarity campaign, the Solidarity concert, staging a revolution. I'm with the band uh, for, uh, in order to support the freedom, artistic freedom and the freedom of expression in uh, Ukraine, Belarus and Russia. It's a concert which would be broadcasted for free by BBC Arts and is played in London where there would be artists from Belarus currently residing in Kiev, uh, from Moscow and from um, you know different countries as well, from uh, from Ukraine as well, playing at the same stage with uh, Dave Gilman from the uh, Pink Floyd. So there would be this international campaign. Uh, you'd be able going to the BBC webpage to uh, watch the whole concert live. But we would also you know um, show our support and are happy to inform about that that you have this opportunity. And we want to remind everyone, next week we'll have a special, the Ukrainian local elections will be taking place. So those are for uh, all the mayors, for all of the kind of village city assemblies and also the regional assemblies. Uh, to end up tonight though, we have a great video from one of our correspondents when they were in Belarus, uh, looking at life in a small Belarusian village uh, after Lukashenko has been in power for so long. Anyway, it's been a great show. Thank you so much. Uh, and hang on for the next video and we'll catch you next week. Good night. Як не знаю, что тут будет. Ну что тут? И тут изменения, может, какое будет. Вы думаете, будут изменения? А кто я? Я думаю, может и нет. Ну знаете, мы уже боимся выбирать другого. Почему? Боимся вообще. Почему? Ну знаете, как не пошла бы война. Вот знаете, из-за это. Нам разницы а нема. Вы, нам а, любого а, человека а, можно выбрать. Мы боемся. Знаете, к войне бы это не было бы, как на Украине бедные люди страдают. Мы будем думать, что в Украине тоже скоро все наладится. Ну, да. Русческая, это то же самое, что Англия, консервативная. Как Англия? Да, консервативная. У нас лучше так, чем еще хуже.